We're half an hour away from the opens in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. You're watching The China Show. I'm Yvonne Mann with David and Glenn. Let's get to your top stories today. Stocks across the Asia-Pacific slumping, led by Japan extending this global sell-off after a mixed U.S. jobs report, adding to fears here that the Fed is actually behind the curve when it comes to rate cuts. Also ahead, and speaking of economic data, China is set to further open its factory and healthcare sectors to foreign money as it seeks growth sparks. Inflation data is out this hour, which is set to show a further economic slack taking place there. Plus, a deep dive into the battle for chip supremacy between Washington and Beijing and where it could be headed under a new U.S. administration. Let's get ready for this and what has been a pretty volatile Monday. We are basically seeing Asian stocks extending this global sell-off. There was a bit of disappointment, I guess, no clarity from that U.S. jobs data on whether the Fed's going to go 25 or 50. Non-committal when it comes to the Fed speech here, what we heard from Chris Waller uh, shortly afterwards, saying that he's still open-minded about the size and pace of these Fed cuts as well. So, therefore... All in all, doesn't really do well for risk here today. So you're certainly seeing uh, Asian stocks are falling some 2%. And you're really feeling that hit in Tokyo this morning with the Nikkei 225, seeing losses as much as 3% when the gates open on this Monday morning. That yen, that surged from 2%. We briefly touched below 142. We're slightly reversing some of those moves now, but still talking about a much stronger yen here this morning. And then we're watching the semis very closely. Look at Taipei opening up. And we already seen the likes of TSMC, probably the one that's really dragging the tax lower by 2% or more. Kospi is now 1.5%. Treasuries, they did actually in terms of yields fall across the curve, really was led by the shorter end. That's also reversing a little bit. But you are seeing when it comes to some of the sovereigns in Asia, yields are ticking slightly higher right now. Oil price is also rebounding a little bit, but we basically have been talking about rising the lowest levels we've seen since 2021. Brent basically plunged some 10% last week as well. We've got three big reports from the IEA, OPEC, and EIA on the monthly outlooks this week to look out head to. And iron ore, there you go. We briefly touched below that $90 level for the first time since November 2022. Your risk radar looks like this. You know, dollar yen at 142. You know, you got to look at Aussie yen as well when it comes to risk. And you continue to see uh, right now at least a little bit of I guess, coming off of some of those lows uh, when it comes to that mm. pair. And we're watching, of course, the semiconductor index. There you go. We're down some 2% right now. VIX futures are in the negative territory, but we're watching iron ore and Dalian also following the price that we're seeing out of Singapore this morning. The approach to the open in China is looking like this. We talked about how last week was really just a slew of downgrades that we heard from the likes of JP Morgan, Nomura, UBS, and these long-standing bulls really sort of throwing in the towel when it comes to staying in this market. Uh, and we're futures continue to be in negative territory here this morning. 213 for your Chinese 10-year yield. And yes, a slightly weaker RMB at 710. Yeah, and we'll, we'll hear from Goldman Sachs, which, you know, as things stand at 4.9%, is already one of the highest growth forecasts yeah. for China on the street. And uh, they'll be joining us uh, right when uh, we get those inflation numbers coming through in about 20, 28 minutes from now or so. Uh, in the meantime, though, when you look at uh, Fed pricing, as Yvonne is pointing out, right, this debate, whether we go 25 or 50, we were hoping that post the jobs report, we'd be closer to either end of it. And certainly, we're still at 33 bips. So we're still in between. There's still a case to be made for both, for both sides. Now, right when the numbers came out, we did hear uh, from Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, and also Fed Governor Christopher Waller after the release of those numbers. Have a listen. Overall, I would say for the U.S., the kinds of metrics that we would monitor that would summarize risks whether it's asset valuations or the degree of leverage, th things, look, things look good. There are not, I don't see red lights flashing. I believe that the balance of risk has shifted toward the employment side of our dual mandate and that monetary policy needs to adjust accordingly. The current batch of data no longer requires patience. It requires action. Let's bring in Sean Taylor now, Matthews, Asia CIO and Portfolio Manager. He joins us here in our Hong Kong studios. Uh, wh how, why is the market reacting so negatively? Yeah, I mean, I think the Fed's in a very tricky position at the moment. Um, I think when the data came out on Friday, the, the, the sort of number of, it was went to 40 basis points. 
Mm. Um, when Fed Governor Wallace spoke, it went up a bit. And I think the way the market's sort of interpreting this is that, you know, why is the Fed not cutting? Uh, you know, cut more, because it's probably going to be 25 um, in September and then potentially 50 in November, but depending on the data. Now, probably when you look back and say, well, why is the Fed not going to cut more aggressively? And I think if they did, it would actually be more worrying for the markets because it would mean that growth was really falling. One is I think a lot of the Fed members think there's normalisation, as Janet mm. Yellen said. Secondly, GDP is fine. Yeah, and demand is fine. So people are saying, well, if GDP is fine, demand's fine, financial conditions are fine, you know, maybe the jobs, the jobs will recover. And then thirdly, normally when they cut 50 basis points, it's normally when there's a crisis or jobless claims are up more like 400,000 rather than 200,000. Mm. So, you know, I just think that maybe the market's hoping for more. Um, but clearly, we've done well in markets. Some of these areas that have, have gone up a lot, we've recovered from that first week of August, yeah. almost up to the highs, and people are taking profits again. How much further downside do you see short term? So I think we're down 4 or 5% on MSCI, I think all country or world. Uh, do we get into a, a, a technical correction here? I mean, is, is a 5% decline from here something that's uh, to be expected? I think in the in the hotter areas we could get you know another five to seven maybe even ten percent and bringing that to Asia we could probably get you know another ten percent in Korea and Taiwan if things you know get worse because that's been an area where people have put an awful lot of money into. Right. Oh, how do you look at stocks now? I mean, I, I was thinking maybe just a few months ago it was like nothing that could really deter this rally from falling. Yeah. Whether it was valuations, nothing really. It, are you think? Do you think the best days in stocks are, are behind us now? Um, not, not for the year, okay. but, but certainly for the quarter. I remember in June we were, we were talking and you know, Asia was up 15% and everyone was quite worried. We'd just <laughs> climbed a wall of worry. Yeah. We'd made uh, 15%. The yeah. <laughs> then the markets have fallen. You know, I, I think we end up at 10 to 12% by the end of the year. We just have a rotation now. Um, in, out of into sort of more interest rate sensitive stocks, into more defensive stocks, out of some of the tech, especially where the throffy valuations were. Um, and then I expect when things calm down, when we know who's the next president, when we know where rates are, mm. and when we get to the start of the rate cutting cycle, because Asia works well when rates start cutting and we know there's more cuts. The first, over the first one, it's always difficult. Mm. So, you know, I think that because that goes into earnings. So if you know there's five or six rate cuts coming in the next 18 months, Asian central banks start to cut, and that's very positive for consumption and good for earnings. And that's when markets reflect it. So I think a couple of down months in markets where we've got to manage volatility. And then I think we'll have a pretty good run into the end of the year and into next year. So where would the winners lie? Because to your point, Asia does well when the cutting cycle begins. But also, Asian hasn't done this well going into a cutting cycle. To your point on Korea, yeah. Taiwan, and I'll throw even Japan into that. Mm. So do I look elsewhere now for the likely winners here? Well, we've been moving more money into ASEAN. Mm. Vietnam's always been a core holding for us. We've increased that. We've put more money into Indonesia. We've put more money into Malaysia. And we think you just have to keep some of those you know, un unloved markets where they're, they're, they're much cheaper uh, relative to history, and you, you are seeing earnings picking up, and they will be direct beneficiaries of rates being cut over the next year. The really tricky one is normally when you get rate cuts in Asia, you go and buy semis, you buy hardware, but they've already run because they've already run on the AI theme. So I think this time it's trickier. Uh, well, treasuries, though, I'm looking at what's been going on, and, and it's been pricing quite a bit of these price cuts yeah. already, um, rate cuts, I should say. Um, do you think it's run a little bit too far ahead of the Fed? Is, is the short end looking a little bit too rich right now? I think it is. I mean, I, th I think the short, the, short, the short end could come up a bit. Um, but I think the, the long end's probably where it, where, where it should be. Um, actually, the five is there's, it's a bit flatter between five and ten, and that reflects uncertainty. And I think, it, think Yvonne, it matters who's the president, because if, if Trump comes in and there are tariffs, that could actually be inflationary. You know, if he cuts taxes, that could be inflationary. If um, Harris comes in, it's probably status quo. Uh, maybe even taxes go up, maybe there's a bit more fiscal, um, you know, help. All right, Sean. Well, that's all. We have more from Sean Taylor there, Matthews, Asia CIO and Portfolio Manager. We're checking uh, one stock in particular, its debut in Malaysia. This is 99 Speed Mart. So climbing from about 13 to 14 percent this morning. Uh, this is the sort of roadside snack seller, I guess is what you could call it. Um, but yeah, having a pretty good day.
out in KL this yeah, morning. Yeah, flooring it, just to borrow the, uh, <laughs> the road analogy there. Uh, the other big piece of news, in fact, that just broke about five minutes back here, OCI, and we understand it based on the board, has not approved this uh, transaction uh, to sell the global methanol business here to Methanex, two billion, just over $2 billion there. Uh, is the price of that transaction, which is based on the news flow coming through, is expected to close the first half of, of next year. So two big pieces of breaking news. More, of course, in a moment. And we haven't even gotten to the big news out of China today, which could see, of course, that market uh, extend the sell if we're seeing globally as well. Coming up to um, some economic numbers coming through out of China as well. Latest CPI and PPI numbers coming through. Uh, as of, at about the time the market opens, we'll break those numbers to you. And as we mentioned, Goldman Sachs will be joining us for instant analysis there. Counting up to the open of trades, just under 20 minutes away in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, and in Shenzhen. This is The China Show. Good morning. Right, welcome back to shows you're watching. Well, you're watching the China show. So a couple of things today. So apart from the, the global equity sell-off, which, by the way, might show up uh, in Chinese equity markets, not to the extent we're seeing it in the likes of Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, but certainly the, the down arrow story likely to show up in markets at the, in the opening minutes. Uh, we'll be getting the inflation numbers coming through in a moment, too. We are in the window for credit numbers, arguably more important, of course, as forward-looking indicators. Iron ore took out 90 bucks for the first time since November of 2022, uh, about an hour or so back. And if you remember what November 2022 was, that was when China was coming out or still in a lockdown. So not exactly the, the, the sort of best comparison there. And the 30-year bond yield down every single day last, last week. And that goes into the inflation story, which we'll get a better indication of in about 15 uh, minutes from now. Mm -hmm. And some news here uh, when it comes to China. So the country will fully open its manufacturing sector to foreign investment mm -hmm. and is also allowing more room for overseas capital, particularly when it comes to the health sector. Let's bring in Min Min Law, our China correspondent, with more on this. So how big of a deal are these changes? Yes, yeah, so China has now lifted all restrictions when it comes to foreign investment in the manufacturing sector. There's already been zero restrictions when it comes to the free trade zone. So they are re lifting the remaining restrictions in the rest of the country. These are pretty minor ones like requiring majority Chinese ownership in printing factories, for instance. Mm. So I think what's more significant is that the Commerce Ministry has also separately announced that they are liberalizing the healthcare sector and they are allowing full foreign ownership of hospitals in all the tier one cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen and other big cities as well. Uh, although foreign investors cannot acquire public hospitals, of course, and also businesses related to traditional Chinese medicine, um, they are also liberalizing the biotech sector so investors can now come into um, developing development of technologies related to stem cell uh, gene therapy for instance so this comes several months after the third plenum mm. so is the government really following up on some of those pledges to open up the economy to foreign investments especially after we've seen very weak numbers the foreign investment outflows this year it's down nearly 30 percent in the first seven months of this year and Chinese state media also couching this in terms of the juxtaposition against, you know, U.S. protectionist measures so far. Mm. Okay, yeah, so speaking of economic data, unflattering, the, the inflation numbers are coming in 14 minutes. Give us a preview. Yes, so uh, consumer price index expected to improve slightly to 0.7%, up from 0.5%. So we're edging closer to that 1% mark. I think some economists are expecting maybe we can hit 1% by the end of the year. Producer's price index, that's the most worrying one. It's expected to decline further to 1.5%. Uh, the previous month was negative 0.8%. So this is where uh, it's largely driven by the declines in commodity prices, your iron ore, oil, steel, uh, reflecting that persistently weak domestic demand. And that's that's where the former PBOC governor, Yi Gang, also said inflation is that target that China really needs to pay attention to now. Min Min, thank you so much. Min Min Lo there with a preview of the inflation numbers coming through in about. Mark, your, your watch is now 13 uh, minutes from now. Still with us here uh, on set is Sean Taylor, of course, uh, out of Matthews Asia to talk us through, of course, where we are with this Chinese market. We've been waiting for a catalyst. The market's been cheap for some time. Um, Earnings, you could make the argument both ways. The other thing, that the new thing that showed up recently is an equity market in the U.S. that seems to be faltering. That was always the, the sort of plan B for investors, not to get into China because the other side of the trade did very, very well. 
is this finally the moment these valuations start to move higher? You know, I think it's a, a very good point. I mean, China's looking relatively better over the last few weeks because other markets are falling, and particularly in Asia as well. Mm. But, and so there is a case that it's less correlated. It, it is more defensive. It has been. But I think you have to be careful which areas you invest in. Mm. And, you know, on paper, it's 8.6 times earnings, which is just, just slightly above the February point where the market then rallied very nicely into May the 17th. Mm. Um, we don't think there's going to be any big bang news coming out to really help the market. There's just going to be policy to, to stop the decline. I mean, you know, the data's been pretty poor. But uh, we're, we're, we're still worried about earnings, and this is why you have to be selective. You know, the MSCI China, you know, we've had about still the, the, the worst 12 quarters of declining earnings. Mm. This quarter was slightly better, but there's still like 19% of companies... Um, um, missing, yep. eight percent beating. In the A share, it's even worse. You're still getting 25 to 30 percent missing. So the A share is clearly worse off. The companies that are doing better are the ones that have been able to deal with the environment better. Also, buy back shares, more capital management, um, you know, and, and less subsidies. So they're basically using their own. Um, capital management to, to win. But you wonder how long that can go on, David, as the economy is still quite weak. Um, but selectively, you know, we, we've probably got more in China. Well, we have more invested in China than we had three months ago. Okay. Um, but in very selective areas. How, how selective? Where, where do you still find value now? Well, I suppose there's value everywhere, but <laughs> in terms of where we got value plus earnings going up, I mean, still in communication services, more, more, more MSCI China. Um, but more selective companies. I mean, we like the platform companies, okay. not all of them. Um, we've just rotated from banks, which had held up very well, particularly state banks, mm -hmm. and gone into insurance companies. Because I think, you know, maybe in three months you'll be buying the banks back again. Mm -hmm. But that SOE trade worked very well. Um, and I think now with the mortgage refinancing rumours, etc., that they're probably... You know, they'll probably lose a bit of steam. The earnings weren't very good. But some of the, some of the um, insurance companies um, are probably a bit more leveraged. They've been, they're cheaper, underperformed, and you're seeing better earnings come through. Why do you think the sell side, particularly in, recent one, in the recent one or two weeks, have been quick to downgrade China? Like, has there been anything new, is, is my question to you, as hmm. someone who does the buying? I suppose if you've thought there's going to be a catalyst that the government would come out and there'd be a new measure here and a new measure there. Right. And they're just seeing the data's not improving. But I think people are misreading the market because people are so focused on government policy. But we all know, you know, from being in Hong Kong and just seeing what's been happening on the ground, you know, income, income is low in China. You know, people's income's been cut. People have been forced to pay back. Um, consumption, it's not just a property issue. It's basically the confidence of the average person where the job market's pretty weak, and that needs to be addressed if consumption's going to pick up. Mm. You're not going to spend money if you're worried about your job. Yeah? I mean, that, or you've got less money. You know? And I think that's the core issue. It's not like, well, there's going to be another property measure. Yes, that will help in the long term. But in the short term, particularly, maybe we're too close to it in the financial world, but you know, you're seeing you know, service industries having their salaries cut. It's not good. Income growth is, is weak. You know, it's been strong everywhere else. So I think that's the major concern. Um, how should I deal with the U.S. election in just a few yeah. months? Uh, it, it, is, is China going to get significantly hit by or in terms of how sensitive what we're going to get in terms of who, who comes out as president? Or how do you look at that election risk now? I look at it on, a, on a, how, how do we protect portfolios given that risk is valuations. Okay. And at eight, 8.6 times, you know, maybe our, our forecasts are wrong because earnings might be weaker, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's in the price. Um, I mean, the, the RMB has already come under pressure anyway. Um, it's not as if people don't know it might happen. But obviously, I think there's probably a couple of months of, of roadway there. I mean, if, it cle if it's clear in the, the polls towards, you know, end of, end of October that, China, uh, that Trump's going to get in, then it's clearly a risk. Yeah. Um, but it's probably not a great, as great a risk as it was before. I think the real issue in China is the domestic demand's not picking up and the earnings are not coming in. All right, Sean. Thank you, Sean Taylor there, Matthews, Asia CAO and Portfolio Manager, kicking off the week for us. Uh, we're just checking one stock in particular, and it's China Renaissance. So uh, they resumed trade uh, today uh, after fulfilling some requirements prescribed 
uh, by these Hong Kong exchange rules. So that's what we're hearing here today. But take a look at the stock plummeting some 72 percent, Dave. Yeah, it's been shut since April 3 of last year. So there is obviously an element of catch down uh, taking place. It was, of course, other reasons that we might be seeing this premium gain uh, being baked into the stock here, down 72 percent at the resumption of at the resumption of trade. Uh, going into the Monday session today, flip the boards, please, for your initial pricing of how markets are likely to open uh, just seven minutes away, likely down 1% on the Hang Seng Index this Monday morning. This is Bloomberg. Right, so equities are falling out of bed this Monday morning. Uh, if you think this is bad, look at the rest of the region. So we're doing relatively okay uh, with 1% declines. And we'll see, of course, how things shape up or shape down uh, when we get to the opening bell, of course, and we, when we do get the inflation numbers coming through. Too. Yeah, I mean, is that going to just add to some of these economic worries and wobbles that we're seeing uh, across these markets here right now? But certainly that is uh, one thing that could add to maybe this economic malaise that China can't seem to kind of get out of here right now. Uh, some stocks to watch at the open. We've been talking a little bit more about what's been going on and what Min Min Lo was just talking about uh, when it comes to opening more manufacturing to the healthcare sector, to foreign money. There you go. You're seeing some of these healthcare stocks are rallying on the, on the process of that news here, MetLife Technology, for example, up some 4%. And it comes down to really what we're going to hear from these uh, CPI numbers, PPI numbers. So it looks like we could tick higher for CPI prices, but we really haven't seen a 1% print, I, I believe, since, no, since 2023. It's mm. been more than oh, close to a year. Um, and, and really when it comes to the PPI prices is that things could actually look even worse uh, with more deflation there. Uh, yeah, and you know, I think w when you strip out things that, that tend to move quite a bit, like you know, food, and within food it's pork, and energy, of course, we're talking about oil prices uh, falling further, you really want to look at cores. And this is something our you know, economists at Bloomberg Economics have pointed out following the July print, where we saw a 0.3% rise from a negative print uh, over in June. So we'll be watching year and year, uh, month and month, and within that, of course, the sub gauges to get us a better indication of how this economy is doing. The opening bell is just ahead. This is Bloomberg. you're watching the China show it is a pretty roller coaster ride in markets here today just given that jobs report in the US didn't give us too much clarity on what the Fed's really going to do it was a mixed report overall and you're feeling that across some key markets like Hong Kong which is down some 1% but really Japan is feeling it the most today given the surge in the yen uh, since Friday so certainly that's one to watch we're seeing a little bit of that fact track here when it comes to the yen strength same when it comes to dollar China we're still talking about 710 levels this morning we'll see how this inflation print if it really matters much for, mar for markets here today. I mean, effectively, we've seen, I think, what, seven weeks of strength coming through uh, in, in the Chinese currency. I mean, although you could make the exception last week, which is a flat week, although the broader story there, to Yvonne's point, is really a weaker U.S. dollar, and where we're trading on, D on the Dixie, for example, I think we're trading near that 100-week moving average for the first time in, um, in quite some time. And as you can see, oh, man, check, check out the open. Okay, 1.3%. Uh, on Mao Tai, um, its peer, of course, also seeing some declines there as well. Okay, half of 1% to the downside, which is quite a bit. Eight cents of 1% was the decline that we had on, on Friday, which actually now puts, so 31.79 is the level you want to track on the CSI 300. That was the low back in Feb. Below that, uh, we're looking at a fresh five-year low on the benchmark. Hong Kong very quickly, as the numbers break, of course, on the inflation print uh, coming through as well. We're down about 1%, and as you can see, all the big stocks on the benchmark, from Tencent to Construction Bank, all down in the order of about half of 1% to about 1%. The inflation numbers are out. Yes, so it's actually a miss for both of, of the CPI and PPI numbers mm -hmm. here. I'll go through CPI first, so 0.6% is what was uh, came out and, and the expectation was something about 0.7 percent 
uh, print here. So we're slightly missing estimates there, although we are seeing an improvement from July, but it's quite marginal. PPI prices, though, we are deeper into deflation. So we're talking about 1.8% lower. The survey was for a 1.5% print here, but basically that continues that streak that we've seen when it comes to PPI prices for some time now. Um, so certainly the, the, the data doesn't look too good. Let's, let's get instant analysis now from Pui Shan, Chief China Economist at Goldman Sachs. She joins us here in our studios. First takeaways from these numbers. Yeah, if you want to kind of get an understanding of China demand supply balance, nothing is better than looking at the CPI or price indicators. And this is, as Ivan was saying, is weaker than economists were expecting. I would argue the CPI print maybe is even weaker than the numbers are showing because the month of August, we got a boost from food prices, the yeah. inclement uh, weather conditions, the higher vegetable prices, that boosted the CPI. But despite the boost from food prices, we're getting 0.6%. So I think uh, that's the number you want to uh, take a look at, and that tells you how weak domestic demand is relative to supply. Now, the, I mean, is the, is the economy better off now compared to at the start of the year? Like, how are you, how are you guys tracking activity now? I mean, this is probably the most important point here, inflation. So I want to get a sense of where this looks in, in a couple of months. Right. Uh, so the, we are at a very interesting juncture. If you look at the China data PMIs, for example, right. uh, you know, March, April, it was picking up, giving people hope of a recovery. Um, but once we get to June, July, August, the activity data, uh, by and large, uh, had been decelerating or deteriorating, uh, which is quite concerning. So we think in the third quarter, uh, uh, GDP tracking seems to be uh, pretty lackluster. But at the at the same time, uh, what's noticeable is the government reaction to the weakening data. Both policy meetings are emphasizing they still want to get to close to 5% and what they're doing. You look at the government bond issuance in the month of August, 1.8 trillion RMB of issuance. That is the single right. largest monthly issuance ever even bigger than June 2022 when we just came out of Shanghai lockdown. So I think we're at the juncture that the organic private demand seems to be weakening more than we would like to see. At the same time, policymakers are getting uncomfortable. How do you get out of this? I mean, they've all, you know, policymakers have obviously been dealing with multiple priorities, right? They've prioritized preserving bank margins, uh, I, I, the currency a little bit more than actually fighting deflation here right now. Are we seeing constraints in really kind of reducing rates to, to invigorate prices again? And, and, and maybe like a mortgage cut, for example, is that more of a better way of stoking prices? Yeah, I think that helps. Um, you look at uh, uh, what's being reported on what the government is trying to do, cut mortgage rates on existing borrowers because China doesn't have an automatic refi mechanism built in the uh, monetary policy transmission. Mm. Um, we think that definitely helps, especially in a downturn. Every single bit uh, you know, is welcome uh, on the easing front, but it's not going to solve all your problems. If you do the math and looking at whether it's a 50 basis points a cut on existing uh, mortgage interest rates or 100 basis a cut, it's not going to translate into more than, say, 15, 30 uh, basis points of a GDP uh, in terms of annual interest rate savings. So given the problem we're facing today, uh, we don't think that's a game changer. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, every single, as long as easing measures are helping households and reducing default risk, it's a welcome sign. Your, your growth forecast is 4.9%. Is there upside risk to, to that number? Because as you point out, it feels like policymakers are starting to respond. I think of uh, China's growth, if you look at all the economists' forecasts, there's more downside risk than upside risk in the sense that things can always go wrong, right? Like unexpected 2022 lockdown, we only got uh, three percent real GDP growth. So that type, you can certainly things can go wrong. We are in a very unpredictable, uncertain geopolitical environment. There are downside risks, but at the same time, the upside risk is more limited in the sense that policymakers they're issuing a lot of bond. They're not trying to get to six percent growth, right? The intentions are getting close to five, which is the target they set for themselves. Right. So you think about the asymmetry that they're trying to get close to five, but no intention of a far above. Mm. But if things go wrong, you can certainly get to a downside surprise. There was some hope that potentially we could see this year that consumption and the property market could detach themselves. But it seems like they're still quite intertwined. 
Right. Is that going to stay that way? Right. This is where the near term versus the long term, how do you balance it, right? In the longer term, let's say you still have your income, you don't want to buy another property, so you don't have to save for the down payment, which means you can spend more, yes. right? In theory, that is what policymakers want to get to divorcing property and consumption. But in the near term, property means jobs, means income, means confidence. Those are all very important uh, in terms of anchoring consumption. And that's why we're seeing consumption weakness. Is are officials still engaging the private sector? I think a couple of whether it's early this year or last year, I know they they sat down with some of the banks and some of the private sector economies to figure out the policy prescription. And I'm wondering if that conversation is still ongoing right now. Um, I think some of these uh, um, sort of desired uh, um, gesture are uh, still yeah. ongoing uh, to Yvonne's point mm -hmm. that uh, if you think about different priorities by the policymakers, uh, if you ask them, do you want to continue opening up? They mm -hmm. say yes. If you want, still want to reform, certainly. Do you mm -hmm. want to support private investment? Absolutely. But at the same time, you have local government leveraging. You have a financial sector crackdown. You just have a menu of priorities yeah. uh, all at the same time, making the market very very difficult to sort of figure out what which priority is going to wing out at the end of the day. Are, are you worried? Uh, yeah, we do see look at uh, you know credit impulse and uh, uh, companies' earnings and consumption and you know going onshore, talking to people. Sentiment is weak. Certainly, there are a lot of uh, issues that we're concerned about. Mm. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what we've been seeing. Maybe some bright spots is is the strength in the currency. Um, is this purely just a dollar-driven story here right now, or, or do you think this sort of strength can last? I think mostly it's dollar. Okay. If you overlay okay. DXY versus the CNY, uh, it's quite strongly correlated. So uh, I think uh, uh, most of the strengthening is driven by uh, DXY at the you know fundamental root. Certainly positioning and because of uh, so much of uh, uh, you know carry uh, positions built over the past few months uh, that exacerbated the um, the market move. But mostly I think that's a dollar-driven move. Mm. We heard. I think last week we had the, the, the Bund Summit. And yes. I think we heard from the former PBOC governor, uh, Igang, talking about how he hopes to see the GDP deflator turn positive in the coming quarters. Do you see a path between the current situation and us seeing some sustainable inflation in China at mm -hmm. some point? At the moment, it's challenging um, because if you ask yourself what is driving that very weak price signals, it is abundant, more than abundant supply um, that shows up in the uh, strong export growth. Right. So is that picture going to change anytime soon? Um, probably not. And at the same time, if you think about the demand, what is driving weak demand? I think sentiment, confidence, and certainty about the future uh, are a big part of that. Is that going to change overnight? Probably not. So in that sense, uh, I'm uh, glad that uh, former policymakers and current policymakers probably realize it's important to get to a uh, positive inflation or stronger inflation, but it's a, not an easy task. Hmm. I, I'm holding on to your latest research, which is understanding China's economic statistics. And thank you so much for giving us this, this, this red book. Tell us a bit more about why. why. Why write something like this? Yeah, number one, uh, China data can be very tricky to interpret. We get a lot of clients asking us, do you have a primer on this? Do you have a primer on that? We put everything in one place. You can take a look and get to see which data point to pay attention to, uh, which data point may be noisier. Uh, and number two, we think this is differentiated. You can't get it anywhere else. Uh, and we only update it once every five to 10 years. So this is a, a lot of team effort going into it. We're very proud of it. We're going to make uh, some copies available at our China conference this week. Mm. Okay. Well, outside of the usual economic indicators and, you know, a couple of hundred pages yeah, here on some, some of the other metrics, signal to noise <laughs> ratio, what have you, what do you think is the most important economic indicator that is outside of the usual mm. list of releases that we get from the government? Uh, the most important, I certainly would uh, put that inflation on top because okay. it is a summary statistic on demand, on supply, uh, and it's uh, going to influence our expectation. Uh, you guys were talking about the Fed and all the central banks are super focused on inflation expectation. Yeah. So I think for that reason, this is a very important signal to watch. Hui Shen, thank you so much. Fantastic there, uh, Chief China Economist there at, at Goldman Sachs. Uh, we're down about half of 1% in the CSI 300. Uh, a couple of movers to tell you about. 
So monthly numbers, speaking of property, which we touched on that, down 5% on one of the big ones, of course, on your screens. Monthly number, I think we were down 25%. Yeah, there we go. August sales for Guangzhou uh, Auto. Baidu, JD.com, also seeing some declines on the back of just a broader uh, decline in tech. Uh, Neo should be coming up on your screens very shortly as well. Um, City, I think, came out with a note seeing that the company might... Turn cash, cash flow positive. positive. Um, that's why you're seeing maybe a bit of a pop there in the shares and seeing mm. some bright spots across uh, th these red that we're seeing here. So we're up some 15 percent. But China Wonka, that one was interesting as well. That sales thump seems to have worsened here. And we saw those August contracted sales uh, there. So that's why the stock is down close to 5 percent this morning. China Renaissance, that's the one to watch. We talked about resuming trade this morning after what, five months, you said? Or so? Uh, no, 5 plus 12. Yeah. April 2020. Yes, Sorry, yes, what, sorry. what year is it? 2024. <laughs> it's 2024. <laughs> yeah. Sorry I, I, I got a cross eye with that as well. Yeah. Uh, but yes, there you go. We're pairing off, but we're still talking about 53%. Off the lows of the day. Off the lows Just of down the day. 50. There. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. So Japanese companies are increasingly abandoning an approach to business in China that once seemed, well, agnostic and immune to politics. Now, it's a significant shift for a country that was once the biggest single investor in the Chinese economy. Let's bring in James Manger, a Chinese economy and government senior reporter, to talk us through this. What's going on, James? So, you know, Japanese and Chinese relations have been on and off. I mean, you know, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're terrible. You know, historical, you know, the historical issues between the two have made the politics and the, you know, the diplomatic relations very difficult repeatedly over the last, say, 20 years. But the business community would seem to be immune to that, so much so that uh, scholars used to talk about hot business, cold politics. And, and what we're really seeing in the last few years, you know, sort of coming out of COVID especially, is that's really starting to change. Japanese companies are really not interested in investing in China right now. Um, you know, the, the amount of investment has fallen off, as you see in the chart there. Uh, you know, the companies that we speak to, basically no one is adding to their investments in here. Uh, some companies pulling out. You've seen Mitsubishi pulling out. You've seen Honda closing factories. You've seen other, comp uh, other companies are increasingly shifting their investments elsewhere, whether it's the U.S. or whether it's Asia. And there isn't really uh, any desire at the moment. To, to, to add to the investments they have here. Uh, Nippon Steel, for example, announced they're pulling out their JV. Partly that was to do with the, the, the difficulties in the car market here. Japanese, most of the customers were Japanese car manufacturers. Japanese car brand sales in China are not great. And so that was one driver for them. Another driver was they're trying to buy US steel and their, their JV in China was being raised as a security risk by US politicians. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of different factors here. One is, the Chinese economy is not great. Uh, sales for things like Japanese cars and steel and other products are not doing well. And Japanese companies look around the world and they say, why would we put money in China where returns may be a couple of percent? Or we could put money in treasury bills in the U.S. and get returns of 5%. Uh, and, you know, we're not taking a currency risk. We're not taking a geopolitical risk. The risks in the U.S. are zero, effectively, and the risks in China are high. Uh, so, you know, Japan is still the largest single foreign investor. Japanese company is still the largest single foreign investor here. But, you know, notwithstanding everything the Chinese government has done over the last two years to try and bring back foreign investors after COVID, it really isn't being successful for this, you know, for, for these for these companies. So is this sort of the, the peak of, of this engagement between Japan and China, you think, James? Or do you think there are signs that maybe something could turn around in the next few years? I think if the Chinese economy starts to really grow again and people, uh, the risk reward ratio changes, um, I think you, know, you, will still, you will still see some companies who are wanting to get into this market. Yeah, you know, there are companies that are still here and they're still increasing their investment. Panasonic, for example, announced last year that they were going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to build a new factory for making rice cookers and air conditioners, you know, expensive rice cookers and air conditioners for China's middle classes. Uh, Muji, for example, is increasing their. Uh, is increasing the number of stores they have it. Uniqlo was also doing very well until recently. So there are some companies, you know, services companies, B2C companies that still see the China market and look at it and say, look, this is a really, this is a good market that we can make money in. But, you know, the, right now the risks for a number of reasons are just too high for, for many, many Japanese companies. And it's not just the geopolitical risks. There was a stabbing earlier this year in Suzhou where a Japanese mother and her, and her child were stabbed while they were waiting at the bus stop 
for the for the Japanese school bus. And the man who stabbed them tried to get on the bus to stab more of the children. And unfortunately, the the bus lady, the bus assistant, was blocking the door, and he stabbed her, and she died. Um, that was an incredibly shocking incident for the Japanese community. It was incredibly shocking for everyone in China, but especially for the Japanese yeah. community, where there has always been this concern that you know politics and, and the historical issues could lead to a repeat of the 2005 and 2012 anti-Japanese riots. And when suddenly parents are looking at this, at this and saying, it's not safe for my kids, it's not safe for my family, you know, the people don't want to be in places where they might get stabbed just for being Japanese. And so, you know, families leave, companies leave, companies don't bring money in because they're worried about not just the geopolitical risks, plus also the lack of profits, but then they're worried about their personal safety. So, you know, if there's a turnaround in those kind of things, better returns, more, you know, better safety, better explanation of why the Chinese are arresting Japanese corporate executives, for example. These kind of things really need to change, I, I think, for there to be a turnaround in, in the in the attitude of Japanese companies to what is still one of their, their it's they're still their biggest trading partner. It's still a huge uh, place, you know, a place with a massive amount of investment. But right now, no one is looking to add to that. Yeah, still a bit of hurdles there. Uh, James, thank you so much. Our senior reporter and Chinese economy and government reporter, I should say, James Mager, joining us out of Beijing. We got plenty more ahead and continue to watch this market's fallout here this morning. We got more on the other side of this break. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The China Show. Some of the big corporate stories that we're tracking for you today. Kushtard has reaffirmed its interest in 7&I after the Japanese company rejected its initial $39 billion acquisition bid. The Canadian convenience retailer says it wants to work with 7&I to agree on a, quote, friendly takeover. A deal would be the biggest ever foreign takeover of a Japanese company. The Nikkei is reporting that Mitsubishi Chemical is seeking to sell its pharmaceutical subsidiary Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma. The company is said to have hired a financial advisor and is sounding out possible buyers, including foreign investment funds. The report says the price could be above $3.5 billion. And Westpac has named Anthony Miller as its next CEO, succeeding Peter King, who is retiring after 30 years at the lender. Miller is currently head of the Business and Wealth Division and will take the top job from December 16th. The incoming CEO has been with Westpac since 2020, previously holding senior roles at Deutsche Bank and Goldman Sachs. Okay, uh, let's recap some of the inflation numbers which came through about 20 minutes back and we'll talk about the sell-off cross assets, everything from equities, bonds and the FX space. So both on a year-on-year -year, uh, sort of horizon here, so consumer price inflation and PPI coming in below estimates uh, with CPI coming in, as you can see, about a tad below uh, the median estimate of 0.7%. Now on a month-on-month -month, uh, sort of time horizon, you look at core and you look at headline inflation, Core actually fell below zero again. Uh, CPI, though, headline price is coming in at 0.4%. So that is at least on that and continuing to show a positive print on headline. Although, as you can see with Core, we did fall back below zero from the positive print that we got uh, in uh, for the month of, of July. Uh, which I guess in many ways underscores a point that our guest this hour was underscoring as well. That the lack of under private sector demand continues to be an issue that... Uh, policymakers are trying to address and also offset by a lot of the sort of bond issue ones that we did see, of course, yeah. in the last month. Kuei still said, though, it's still one of the most important prints out there yes. to really gauge domestic mm -hmm. demand mm -hmm. and where things are here right now. So, yeah, I think PPI prices, we're talking about 19 straight months uh, in deflation here right now, but certainly mm -hmm. that deflation threat still lingers here today. Uh, given just what we've been seeing with the headline. Another check of markets here today. We're also checking very closely what goes on with this you know, overall disappointment, I guess you could say, from that job support. We didn't get that sort of clear sign that the Fed could be cutting by 25 or 50 basis points. Chris Waller from the Fed also speaking shortly after that was a little bit more open-ended as well. So vague. Uh, Fed speak certainly didn't really bode well. That's what you're seeing the Nikkei 225. Uh, we are off some of the lows, but we are still seeing declines about 2% or at least more than 1% losses across the board for most of North Asia here today. Yeah, th th that's a good point to highlight here. So when Europe opens up, we'll probably see declines, but not to the extent that we had you know, when the Asian markets open to, you know, case in point, as Yvonne is pointing out, right, we opened about 3% lower on the Nikkei 225. So we are uh, on better footing 
as we make our way into the rest of uh, the market opens. The next one, of course, comes up, which is uh, Indonesia. And then we get, of course, Thailand and India coming online. Uh, the look across the bond markets following the strong rally that we had last week and the Treasury market currently priced for still closer to a 25 basis point cut from the Fed. Um, we're looking at, as you can see here, so a, a melt up somewhat across the yields following the move down last week. The China 10-year yield, though, is very much in focus. And the 30-year yield, every single day last week, uh, we did see declines on the 30-year yield. Very, very quickly, dollar weakness. Dollar is, as you can see on your screens, so and the 140 handle will be very much in focus on dollar yen if, in fact, we get there at some point. Yeah, SMBC is basically saying the yen is at risk of breaching below that, that level, as you say. MUFG targeting dollar yen at 137 now, so certainly to watch whether how long this yen strength can last here. Coming up next hour, we have plenty more coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the China Show. Hour two, we're looking at the HSI here just a half hour into the session. Obviously, we were shut on Friday uh, due to that typhoon, but it looks like it continues to be sort of a catch down story here today, just given what we've seen globally when it comes to stocks. And we're extending that sort of sell off here in Asia, albeit we'll say we're off some of the lows from the initial get go, especially in Japan, for example. But we're still seeing some downside in Hong Kong by about one and a half percent. You have the confusion, I guess, of the mixed data from the U.S. jobs support to contend with. CPI, PPI prices in China continue to show a lot of risk when it comes to deflation. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the reminder from the inflation print in China, and you couple that with the reality that the market is trying to catch up with, which is a slowing U.S. economy, you now have the two pillars of the global economy not doing as well as we thought uh, as recently as six weeks back. And you do understand, of course, why there is concern about multiples out there, some of the crowded trades, uh, AI, semiconductors, the Cosby index down one, Taipei is down about 1.7 percent. We're down about 1.6 uh, to get underway this week as well. So we are extending this risk aversion that we had really from last week, really one of the worst weeks we've seen in several months depending which benchmark you're looking at. So, uh, you know, just to highlight the chip stocks, for example, we're looking at some of these big names pulling down the benchmarks and some of the names across the region on your screens right now, down to TSMC and Samsung Electronics, right? So if you want to get a sense of how much value we lost last week and further value we're seeing today, uh, the biggest, the single biggest week uh, as far as market cap that was erased, you have to go all the way back uh, to 2022 to get a $4 trillion headline uh, on that. And that's what we saw, $4.2 trillion wiped out of global equities um, last, last week. And we are continuing to see that right now. I think we have a chart to show you that. We have the guys, can we show it up, please, if we can, uh, just to underscore, really. There we go, on your screen. So $4 trillion wipeout, the most in about two years or so. As we gauge, and traders are now trying to I guess understand what do we really need? Do we need a 25 basis point cut where the message is we're not doing too badly? Or do we need a 50, what has other, of course, negative connotations? Which Sean Taylor from Matthews Asia was saying that actually could actually send more panic yeah. across these markets. So it may not be necessarily a good thing. But, you know, this job support didn't really settle that debate. <laughs> no, at we were all. hoping it, it, it would have. You mean the headline numbers were disappointing, misestimates, but then you take a look at, you know, you know, what what really maybe led to more confusion was that you know you had an unemployment rate that actually ticked lower yeah. at 4.2 percent. Average hourly earnings were actually higher. Uh, so how do you kind of make of this? Because right now it doesn't seem like it's suggesting that the economy is in any way heading into a recession just yet. But yes, you are see, still seeing some cooling signs uh, in in the labor market. But yeah, Chris Waller didn't really help too much either no. when he spoke. No, yeah, uh, he he did give some comments. <laughs> Dovish, right after the job support. In fact, ha have a listen to uh, what the Fed governor had to say. I believe that the balance of risk has shifted toward the employment side of our dual mandate and that monetary policy needs to adjust accordingly. The current batch of data no longer requires patience. It requires action. Yeah, that's why you're hearing the likes of, of Bloomberg Economics saying, you know, this payroll report suggests maybe it's more about 25 now. Mm. Uh, in September, but you can't rule out the possibility of a deeper cut, uh, is, that, is that what uh, Anna Wong is saying as well. But then again, we're taking a look at when it comes to the China data. 
So we saw CPI prices actually rose less than expected last month, and that's really adding to more signs that policymakers are struggling to really get households to spend as well. And, you know, it just doesn't seem like we're seeing any sort of recovery here right now when it comes to domestic demand. No, and on top of that, PPI also fell much more than forecast, which yeah. underscores really the capacity issue uh, that we're dealing with here. And I think uh, just about 40 minutes back, we had Goldman Sachs come on to react to that, right, to your point. And they actually have a 4.9% print, which is among the highest in the street now because everyone has taken yeah. theirs lower. And they actually think consensus-wise... You know, to the question we asked earlier, is there upside or downside risk? She actually thinks there's more downside risk still to what the street is thinking as far as that's concerned. Uh, we asked them on what they thought about this inflation print, which came out about 30 minutes back. Have a look. What's noticeable is the government reaction to the weakening data. Both policy meetings are emphasizing they still want to get to close to 5%. And what they're doing, you look at the government bond issuance in the month of August, 1.8 trillion RMB of issuance. That is the single right. largest monthly issuance ever even bigger than June 2022 when we just came out of Shanghai lockdown. So I think we're at the juncture that the organic private demand seems to be weakening more than we would like to see. At the same time, policymakers are getting uncomfortable. Okay, Mark Ranfield is with us right now to talk us through. Mark, so we have decently bad macro, not completely off the cliff. Why are markets reacting this way? I think basically you, you've got to disconnect between investor expectations and what the Federal Reserve is telling you. So the, part of the reason why you had the sharp reaction on, on Friday evening to the jobs report, if you look at what the, the markets did actually soon after the, the jobs numbers hit the wires, actually the S&P futures started to go up slightly. Then they turned around and went very negative once we got the Fed speaker. So as you were saying earlier, we had a couple of Fed speakers and Mr. Waller probably was the one that caused a little bit more disruption in the market. So investors have convinced themselves that the risks towards a hard landing have become greater. So that's why they're pricing into the curve many, many rate cuts, up to something like 200 basis points worth of rate cuts over the next year or so. And yet, the, the messaging they're getting from the Fed speakers is, yes, we, we think we're moving to the place where we need to lower interest rates, but not by 50 basis points to get the ball rolling. And that's not what investors wanted to hear. So this disconnect is making them fear that the Fed is not just behind the curve, but they're going to be a long way behind the curve. They're going to be playing catch up for quite a long period of time. And that's why equity markets sold off pretty hard on Friday night. Now, getting circling this back to the point where investors and the Fed are on the same page is not going to be very easy because we've just gone into a blackout period. We will not be hearing any more Fed speakers before the meeting next week. We will get a CPI report this week, but by now... People are saying that the jobs numbers are more important than the CPI anyway. So we're going to go into a very tricky period here where if investors are really looking for reasons to price in for a hard landing, we're going to get continued friction around the point where the market it may not be discounting enough and the Fed is not really doing much to put them off. So, yes, it looks like we're going to have some very erratic choppy trading, probably with the downside more likely than the upside in the near term. Yeah, you mentioned the CPI print uh, out of the U.S. this week. We, we also, in terms of the week ahead, we also have an ECB meeting mm -hmm. where it looks like they might be ready to cut rates again, even before the Fed starts with this easing cycle, Mark. So, you know, for FX traders, what are they going to pay more attention to, the ECB or the Fed? In the short term, certainly the European Central Bank, because it, that's the one place that looks as though traders can be more confident of the messaging so the European Central Bank, yes, they've, they've pretty much promised that they will lower rates again. But at the same time, they seem to have some kind of a consensus within the, the central bank there that they won't go too quickly. In fact, they seem to be dialing back to suggest that this one could be the last rate cut this year. They still see inflationary pressures, which they're acknowledging. They don't appear to want to really force the rate cuts ahead. So from that point of view, if they stick to the recent rhetoric, if Christine Lagarde, as she's done pretty well, she's, she's managed expectations a lot better than the Federal Reserve have this year. So if in her press conference she does manage to sell that message that it's a good time for the ECB to take a pause, the euro could do reasonably well out of it. Now you've got the Japanese yen has already been pushing the, lower, the dollar lower. We've seen um, the similar thing playing out in Asia. Now, if you add the euro into that picture, 
It certainly means that traders were paying a lot of attention to what it means for the foreign exchange market, and we could see a stronger euro, weaker dollar by the end of the week. Mark, do we get a, a correction in global equity markets? We're down 4 or 5% from the top on the global benchmark. We asked that question earlier on to one of our guests. He said, you know, 5 to 10% is easy work to the downside from here. What do you think? Yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to avoid, isn't it? If you look at the way the price action has been going, even though, as you were saying earlier, the U.S. data doesn't look as though it's that bad, and yet investors are taking a very bleak outlook from everything, and that's spreading across. Look at Japanese stocks again today. Chinese equities are still in a bit of a, a funk as well. It looks as though it's going to be pretty hard to pull them out of a, a correction period, especially when so many people have been telling us that September is a notoriously very bad month for global equities. So, yes, it wouldn't be surprising at all if we do hit a correction for global stocks. Mark. Thank you, Mark Crayfield. There are Bloomberg MY strategist joining us out of Singapore. And still ahead, we're talking a little bit more about Huawei said to unveil a trifold phone to challenge Apple's iPhone 16. We have details coming up next. This is Bloomberg. All right. Uh, welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We're looking at this extended uh, bout of risk aversion out there and really central to it, the price action we're seeing today. Bottom of your screens, we're down 3 percent on the APAC Semiconductor Index. And some of the names on your screens right now make up, of course, where we are on that index as well. And NVIDIA, of course, took a massive beating last week. In fact, on a market cap basis, global stocks lost $4 trillion of market cap last week. And a lot of that really had to do with these ultra mega cap tech stocks in the U.S. Com not completely racing, but obviously having a really, really bad week. Which takes us into some of the stuff we're tracking this week. Huawei is gearing up for a showdown with Apple, preparing to launch new products at an event, of course, just hours after its U.S. rival is expected to unveil. Is it what, 14, 15? What 16 is it? 16 now. It's 16 you now? keep count, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Almost like the Fast and the Furious series, right? <laughs> Adam Bell is with us here on set to take us through. All right. What products are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at the iPhone 16. I'll just put that out there. But uh, the focus is going to be, yeah, you've got two ones that are coming through. So mm -hmm. Huawei's got their, their latest launch. Uh, what we understand is it could be not a twice-folded design, but a tri-fold design. So you can fold it three times. You get more screen space in a smartphone size. So that's what could be unveiled later today. Uh, it will come just hours after we have the, the iPhone launch. So you've got mm -hmm. the 16, you've got the regular, Pro, Max, the whole lineup, four new devices coming to product or market, rather. A couple of months back, we were thinking perhaps this could set off an a upgrade super cycle because there was all this expectation around artif artificial intelligence, how much would be embedded into the products. That's sort of been scaled back, so we're not really expecting huge sales, but still uh, positive for some suppliers in this part of the world. Luxshare, LG Display, just some of the names. But that focus, Huawei as well. What do we get on the chips front? Because we actually could see the company unveiling new chips today or later today. That's going to be something to watch very closely because, of course, we have seen Huawei really trying to get something that rivals NVIDIA's semiconductors to market. All right. Mm. Uh, Bell, stay on here for a second. We're going to bring in our next guest. Uh, joining us now is Christopher Thomas. He's chairman at advisory firm Integrated Insights. He's also in town for the CIDIC CLSA Investors Forum. I see the title of your presentation is really very telling and very timely here. AI competition and the future of semiconductors. Can you just lay out kind of the state of play right now amidst this kind of global competition that we're seeing? Well, I think uh, you see global competition, but it remains a competition between companies. Mm. Um, while what's very interesting is that while geopolitics matters, risk reduction matters, uh, supply chain resilience matters, this remains a product and performance industry. And this remains an industry where if you have the best product, if you have the best technology, your customer is going to buy it. So even though we're five years in, 10 years in, 15 years into the chip war, the industry hasn't really changed that much. And the statistic I mention the most is that even though everyone is trying to de-risk from Taiwan, Taiwan's share of global semiconductor manufacturing has actually gone up in the last five years. And the level of supply chain change is actually quite small. Where are we in the competition right now? Everyone's doubling down on AI. We may not see a bump from new smartphone sales, but from a technologist's perspective, what's going into these smartphones is actually quite 
We are moving to AI phones, which means you have an NPU inside the processor. We're going to see an upgrade of SOC capabilities. We're going to see real-time translation. We're going to see lots of things of AI, not just in the data center, but at a device level, which hopefully expands the pie of the AI market. The part of your survey also includes uh, asking Chinese companies how they, how they feel about what's going on. So how, how do they feel? Well, so I think, I think the number one thing is that everyone in the industry is optimistic. And again, it goes back to, we say we have a chip war, we say we have all these geopolitical problems. These last five years have maybe been the best five years in the entire history of the industry for everyone. So AI, uh, so Chinese companies believe the future is bright. They're going to see growth. They don't see margins collapsing. They actually see margins going up. But they do have, they do see some fundamental differences with how, when you ask actually Chinese companies, where will the Chinese semiconductor industry be the most successful? They don't say AI. They say automotive electrification, which are markets where China has more downstream industry control and a larger percentage of the global TAM. Mm. In addition, while Chinese companies and Chinese respondents are optimistic about the Chinese market, they actually still have a tremendous amount of respect for the United States ecosystem. Mm. And the one I always pick out, about one third of our participants sit in China. And we ask them, where will the best talent in the industry grow? What place is the most attractive for talent? 85% of people working in China said the United States. And 60% of the people sitting in China said the United States will be the most attractive for capital investment in the semiconductor industry. So I think they're very clear on where the competitive balance lies. Yeah, I think you were just discussing there that sort of shifted or that dominance more in like the consumer electronics space, automotives, and they're sort of the lower end chips, but advanced sure. chip making capabilities. What do you see from China and what is that gap that you see in the race to catch up to the US right now in terms of years? Well, I think you have to describe what is the gap. So if you just narrow down to a very specific thing about, for instance, the nanometers of a semiconductor manufacturing process and making actually the most complicated parts of the chip, it's still probably three to four to five years. And there's a big debate about how close you can get to it without adding EUV. And you are able to get closer doing double patterning, triple patterning, which means you mean an older technology and you just run the machines more often. But it's more expensive, the costs are higher, and the yields are lower. And you can get the performance closer. So how far the performance gap is depends, maybe 20%, 30%. But then you have to take a step back and say, what does it actually mean? Because we don't care about the speed of the transistor. We care about the capability of the AI cluster. And to bring up a statistic, NVIDIA said over the last 10 years, their inference of their chips has improved 1,000 times. Only 4x of that 1,000 was specifically from semiconductor manufacturing. Mm -hmm. The rest is about how you build the models, how you do the error correction, how you design the chip. Those are all areas where there's much lower barriers. So China can, Chinese companies, to be particular, can get closer even though they don't have the latest uh, performance. You also have to look at the entire AI cluster, the backplane, the model setup, how you run out the data center, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that Chinese companies are doing, above and beyond trying to get closer on the most advanced and difficult models, more than two-thirds of the models that have been launched by Chinese companies are actually smaller models with fewer data points that don't need the most advanced processing. So they're actually going in a different direction to try to get into the market without competing at the threshold, the bleeding edge of performance. You mentioned about EUV, and, and we have seen those restrictions around sure. not only the sales of equipment from ASML and Tokyo Electron, but it's the servicing sure. of those components that are already in China. So how much is China being restricted, again, at the more advanced end? And, and where do you see that going from here? Where do we see that going from here? So I can't predict where government policies go. I think one thing that we've seen with some other restrictions around servicing is that the fabs in China, they've moved from being technicians where they just run a machine that someone else is servicing to being the engineers themselves. So they actually figure out how to do the servicing themselves and build up those capabilities. Um, this may, you know, this is one of those things that in the short run, it may slow down the technology cadence. But in the long run, as Chinese companies invest to do that themselves, it brings up the capabilities of, of the Chinese market. Where does it go from here? I think the real question is, is will the industry 
have a right hand turn where all the existing technology is not as important and you have a new leapfrog that can jump over it. Now we talk about quantum, we talk about photonics, those things are not ready for prime time yet. Yeah. But the critical thing is there's so much installed capital in this industry. And so it's very doubtful in my mind that you can create a whole new innovation that is purely a leapfrog and all that old capital doesn't matter. It's going to be incremental on top of the existing base and it's going to require that existing base to be used. So this is an industry where having an installed base, having a lead is very difficult to conquer. Yeah. And so it will be difficult, again, at the bleeding edge for Chinese companies to catch up. And you mentioned um, that in the end, it, it's, it's, it, they, these Chinese companies have to go global because yes. um, despite all these terror threats and sanctions and the like, I'm just wondering how possible is that? Um, and, and really, is, is you mentioned that we're not seeing that much de-risking, really. How far can decoupling actually go then? Yeah, those are, those are interesting questions. So uh, there's two ways that Chinese companies can go global. Chinese semiconductor companies can go global. One is a Chinese box or a Chinese car that's made with Chinese chips can go be sold overseas. And you see that in the automotive space. You see that in the PC space and other things. The other one is where Chinese chip makers sell chips to overseas companies. They would sell them to Apple or to Dell or to a European OEM. And that's going to be really important to do because at the end of the day, 75% of the chip making market, the people who decide which chips to be bought, are the United States and its allies, US, Japan, Korea, Europe, etc. So unless China only wants to compete in that 25%, where the scale is simply too small hmm. to drive the R&D and the capital, they have to sell to those other countries. Now you say, well, we have geopolitics, uh, we have de-risking, people aren't going to buy. But the critical thing the survey showed us is that for every single type of company in every region, performance and price matters more than the nationality of the supplier. Mm. Because this is a product industry. Yeah. You know, I, I would love to have a fully de-risk supply chain, but it costs money, it costs time, it builds risk. Who's going to pay for that? And people very clearly said, if you had the choice between investing in innovation or de-risking your supply chain, I'm going to invest in innovation. Yeah. So actually, the industry hasn't changed that much in the last 10 years. How far can decoupling go? It, it can never fully decouple because there isn't enough money and time and capital in the world to create two separate supply chains. It's just not possible. But then how does it work with the, the restrictions, though? Because you're seeing even more restrictions that are coming through. Just last week, it was that focus on quantum computing. Sure. And even though you're saying that's not ready for the prime time, obviously, regulators already have it in their sights. Yeah, so... Uh, what you see companies doing today is they are preparing and executing some level of a de-risking strategy, but relatively low-hanging fruit and doing things that are specifically responding to government restrictions. They're not being proactive and saying, hey, there could be a government restriction in the future. I better stop using that supplier now. And in what our survey told us is what's very interesting, I'll just bring up one thing. One third of companies said over the long term, we need to split ourselves up into two separate companies, one focused on the U.S. market, one focused on the Chinese market. Let's say there's about 1,000 interesting semiconductor companies. If one-third of them do that, that means we should have seen 300 to 350 JVs spin. How many have we seen? It hasn't happened yet. Even the companies under the most pressure, the, you know, there's still thousands of NVIDIA chips flowing through China. ASML is still selling into China. So... Companies are very nimble at keeping business going despite all this political pressure. Chris, fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much for, for the time. I think we could be here forever, really. Uh, Chris, Chris Thomas there, chairman at advisory firm Integrated Insights, and of course, Bloomberg Tech reporter here with us on set, Annabelle Jewelers Rights. Uh, we'll have more interviews coming through, of course, out of the CITIC CLSA uh, forum taking place. Uh, the 31st Investor Forum takes place here in the city with those names at those times on your screens. This is The China Show. All right, we're taking a look at luxury stocks here this morning. Uh, we saw when it comes to some of these European peers weakening on some of the woes that we've been seeing out in China as well. So Prada is down some 5% here this morning in Hong Kong. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
11.29 a.m. in Tokyo. And, of course, we're continuing to watch this sell-off across Japanese equities. Yeah, we're still seeing some declines of 2%, but we were seeing as much as 3% earlier. So things are looking a little bit better. But mind you, it's the dollar-yen trade that people were really talking about. How much more upside are we really going to see for yen? 142 levels. We briefly touched below that after that job support. We're coming back just slightly here this morning. Let's get to our Asia equities reporter, Winnie Shu, joining us from Tokyo now, where we really are seeing most of this you know, being felt where you are. What do you think is the big drivers of why Japanese stocks are falling so much? Right. So um, the, the U.S. jobs data definitely was one of the big triggers as it pushed the yen higher. So it actually gave us a reminder that Japanese stock is pretty much still correlated uh, with the moves in currency. So um, we've we've seen that um, stronger yen weighing on the market, but also the concerns around the, the health of the global economy. And uh, some investors are still taking profit from uh, the rally that we saw in Japanese stocks. And with the weak GDP today from Japan, that's also hurting some sentiment in the market. So while a lot of people were talking about that long-term structural reform going on in Japan, it seems like um, the continuous strengthening of the yen will still likely to weigh on Japanese uh, stock market um, in the near term. And actually, um, today when we talk to a strategist, they say that Japan might actually be the market to see uh, the most negative impact among Asian markets when it comes to um, kind of what we're seeing. Um, in, in the U.S. and the, the weaker uh, uh, U.S. jobs data, um, citing the higher volatility um, when it comes to um, the divergence that we're seeing between the Fed's policy and the BOJ's policy. So UBS actually um, just um, a couple days back downgraded Japanese stocks uh, to underweight in t um, on local currency terms. So they cited the, the worries around the global economy and some of the Japanese stocks impacted uh, by the worsening um, Chinese economy as well. And not, not but at least going back to um, the strength of the yen, they say that only about 50% of the carry trades back from uh, 20, 2012 were unwinded so far. So we're likely to see a more strengthening of the yen um, impacting stocks. Yeah, Wendy, to your point, we, one of our guests just now uh, from Matthews Asia talked about how, you know, Japan, because it's done so well like Taiwan and Korea, might be one of those markets that will likely see 5 to 10 percent downsides. Amidst uh, these headwinds, what else are you hearing from investors and how they're what, adjusting their exposure to the Japanese equity market? Right. So one interesting trend that we're seeing is that because of the expectation for uh, the further strength of the yen, lots of global investors specifically are recommending to take off that hedging on uh, Japanese stocks so that even when the stock market is flat or even um, seeing some um, impact on earnings, um, they are still likely to gain from uh, the, the strengthening of the yen when it comes to returns. So we talked to JP Morgan that recently kind Kind of had that recommendation, and also uh, UBS is is recommending um, the, the the similar approach. As well as uh, we we spoke to um, BMP Paribas, they used to have um, recommendation of hedging for Japanese stocks, and they recently lifted that as well. So um, people, a lot of investors, are trying to um, kind of. Um, change their strategies around their FX w when it comes to investing in um, the Japanese equities. And in terms of sectors, um, more are recommending to look into domestic sectors that can benefit from that currency trend uh, versus exporters that are still going to suffer in terms of their er earnings outlook from a stronger yen. Winnie, thank you so much. Winnie Su, there, our Asia equities reporter in Tokyo, really, where I think if you look at the board today, ground zero. Uh, of this equity market sell-off. Now, certainly one one specific stock in Tokyo that's been in focus for weeks now, given this deal that it's on and off, it's on and off. It's Kushtard, latest salvo here, says it remains focused on sealing that deal with 7 and I after the Japanese convenience store operator rejected the initial proposal. Reed Stevenson, our senior editor, has been tracking the story from the get-go and joins us right now out of Tokyo. So the, I think the read the... The, the, the phrasing coming out of Kushtard is they want this to be a friendly uh, takeover. How does it achieve that? 
Yeah, I mean, essentially, we're, we're sort of entering a new phase. We had a long period of silence where really no one really knew what the price was or the terms of this approach that Kushtard made back on uh, in the middle of August, and it was disclosed on August 19th. Um, now we're sort of uh, getting a good sense of uh, how much Kushtard is willing to pay, and therefore uh, we heard from uh, Seven and I on Friday that – it took a very sort of a, a, um, clear tone of not rejecting it outright, but just saying the price is too low. Uh, we have other concerns, including regulatory, you know, potential divestments through anti-competitive concerns. And so, therefore, what we saw this morning was Kushtar's response to that. And again, it's sort of just keeping the door open to talks. And it does seem like um, uh, that there's probably going to be some sort of discussion moving towards a higher offer. And that's why you see 79 shares up, uh, you know, 2 to 3% this morning in what is broadly a down market in uh, Tokyo and across Asia, for that matter. And the fact that they, they were open to, you know, it, it, the price was just too low, we're keeping these talks still open, they're not rejecting the idea of an acquisition itself. Re, you wrote a really interesting piece that this shows that maybe that M&A era is really beginning in Japan and that maybe the mindset is really changing now. Indeed. I mean, the conventional wisdom up to now is that, you know, Japan has been closed to sort of mergers and acquisitions on the scale of, of this, what this might, one might be. Uh, that's everything from, uh, you know, just companies and shareholders being protectionist to a certain amount of government uh, protection for that. But really, in the past few years, that's all changed. We're seeing, um, you know, clear guidelines on, on takeovers. We're seeing this push by the Tokyo Stock Exchange to improve corporate governance. I mean, in fact, you know, a majority of Seven and I's board are, in fact, uh, independent outside directors. I don't think Kustard would have even attempted this had it, had that not been the case. And so, you know, we're really in an environment now where we can really test this openness. And so far, it seems like, you know, things are moving along like they would anywhere else. And so this is being really closely watched as to whether uh, you're going to get into sort of, you know, the classic M&A discussion scenario and then potentially a deal at the end of the road. Reed, thank you, Reed Stevenson, there, our senior editor, joining us out of Tokyo this morning. Other news that we're following as well. A gunman has killed three Israelis at a terminal on Jordan's border with the West Bank, the first such incident since the war in Gaza began. Israel's army says the gunman accessed a bridge crossing from the Jordanian side in a truck and fired shots before he was killed. The victims were identified as forklift operators over the age of 50. Israel closed a crossing while checking the truck for explosives. Right. So Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump, uh, based on the latest uh, survey here, leads the Democratic contender Kamala Harris by one percentage point in this poll that was taken late last week. So it's the New York Times Siena College survey has Trump at 48 percent to the 47 percent for the vice president. Meanwhile, of course, Trump says that countries that trade with currencies other than the U.S. dollar will not do business with the U.S. if he wins. Uh, if he wins office again and would face 100% tariffs on those specific goods. Now, of course, keep in mind it's a big week ahead as far as this conversation goes because in uh, literally two days' time, Trump and Harris will be meeting for the first time Tuesday evening in the U.S., Wednesday around this time, of course, and Wednesday in their only scheduled uh, debate so far. And certainly each candidate in each camp has different objectives. Um, I think on one part, based on our understanding and reporting, is the Democratic camp is focused on things like fact-checking and introducing Kamala Harris as, to, I guess, parts of the, the U.S. audience that might not be too familiar with her. And I think Donald Trump is focused in on, I think, some of the, the perceived speak, the gap in the speaking skills of Kamala Harris and looking to, against pounds in any sort of openings there. Yeah, it, it's politics and it's personality. I think that's what the promo that we've been playing right. for, yeah. for some time now. But the first time that these two really debate each other is certainly going to be something that everyone's going to be watching very closely, given at a time when we had that recent poll hmm. that showed that Trump is actually leading um, Kamala Harris. Uh, so there are signs that just how tight this race is. The last, you know, couple of weeks leading into this debate, it was all about Harris leading these polls now, if not tying with Trump. We have now the latest uh, from that poll saying that maybe Trump is still leading in some parts uh, of the country here right now. We also did talk uh, to Frank Luntz, the pollster, on what to really expect out of this debate this week. 
There's 5% who are undecided right now, and basically they don't like either candidate. They reject Trump because of his attitude and his persona, and they reject Harris because they don't know enough about her. They want to know more of the details, and they're waiting for this debate tomorrow night. Trump on one side, Harris on the other. They want to see the comparison, and that's when they're going to make their decision. Tomorrow night will be the most important day of the entire campaign, and I, like tens of millions of Americans, are be tuning in to see whether Donald Trump can keep quiet and whether Kamala Harris has the details that the public wants. There you go. Hmm. Most important day of the entire campaign. Uh, that's the way to sell it. So something to look ahead to, not just when it comes to this debate. We have CPI prices out of the U.S., ECB meeting, China data. Yeah. There's a lot in store this week as well. Coming up, we were talking about esports in China with NIP Group and what they're doing to boost diversity in a very male-dominated sector as well. Also, talk a little bit more about that listing in the NASDAQ. This is Bloomberg. Right. Um, happy Monday if you're just joining us right now. Hope you had a restful weekend. Um, we're, well, this isn't something we cover very often, of course, <laughs> but if in the event, of course, you're in this part of the universe, and certainly this is a very, very big week as far as esports goes. One of the most uh, popular tournaments is, in fact, underway uh, in Copenhagen. The International is one of the top events, of course, on the competitive gaming calendar. 16 teams fighting it out for a price pool of nearly two and a half million. That's U.S. dollars. That's a uh, record low, though, for competition, which had a price of a pool of, what, 40 million, but seems like another time, really, 2021, 20, which is a good three years ago. Um, but, yeah, um, it's, it's dwarfed compared to the Esports World Cup, Yvonne. Yeah, um well, that has a prize pool of $60 million, and that's about $4 million short of the record Wimbledon prize money this year. It's a reminder of just the growing <laughs> commercial footprint of global competitive gaming. Let's bring in our next guest for more. Joining us now is Mario Ho, chairman and co-CEO at NIP Group. Um, and obviously, China is sort of the, the big esports market, and the largest in the world here right now. But you've just been a listed company in, in, in the Nasdaq just about a little more than a month ago. How have things been since well, going public? It's been fantastic. It was a very important milestone for esports as a whole. Uh, for us, particularly, we've been able to attract a lot of new collaborations and exciting new business uh, that will be coming on the way. Okay. Uh, well, I think you're in a lot of different revenue streams, esports, talent management, events. Yeah. Is that so far the core of what's taking up your time? Or are you looking to sort of grow your revenue streams currently? What, what, are those, what are those priorities looking like right now? So, of course, growing the existing revenue streams that our company has will remain a core importance. Mm -hmm. But in this coming quarter, uh, we're looking to make breakthroughs in terms of uh, the hotel, esports hotel business oh. industry and also the game publishing industry. So we just made an announcement uh, for a joint venture with BTG Home Inn where we'll look to open new hotels very soon. Essentially, eSport hotels, I expect it will take over the internet cafe it, industry. Okay, so what's an eSport hotel? Maybe just for some of our <laughs> viewers who, who might not be too familiar. Understood. Imagine a three- to four-star uh, quality hotel, newly okay. refurbished, uh, very innovative with eSports hardware in the lobbies, across every single room. People can go live there for the night, but also compete and actually have a good time with their friends. Essentially, that's the, the environment we're trying to build here. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that would be interested in that. Um, Mario, it's interesting, though, because particularly when it comes to the esports sector in the West, they've been grappling with a lot of profitability challenges. I take a look mm -hmm. at a, a name like FaZe Clan or Astralis that were both also listed in the NASDAQ and ended up one being delisted, one being bought out, and then the also was no longer trading. Um, it seems like there's still a lot of questions about the business model of mm -hmm. being an esports company. How do you achieve that sort of profitability for you now? Sure, absolutely. So the companies you mentioned just now, I think the problem they both face was that they highly focused on one segment of the entire industry, mm -hmm. which is esports teams. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how profitable that com those companies could get, it depended heavily on the price money that they were able to achieve through performance. And performance, you can manage to maintain at a certain high level, but you're not going to be guaranteed to winning trophies every single year. For us, we have a diversified business portfolio, and we really see the increased monetization avenues through our esports hotel business coming up and our attempts into the gaming publishing, games publishing industry to actually be the final jigsaw, uh, the final 
final pieces of the jigsaw to our business model. We've been able to provide and produce offline events for the publishers. We have live streamers promoting content for them. Our teams are competing in their leagues, but for us to actually go into the dollars that could be made publishing games ourselves now and then creating leagues that we will be owning and managing at the same time and utilizing the existing core businesses, that's how I think we're going to make strides in terms of increasing profitability. Is, is, so is the bulk of the future profits of the business outside of managing talent, for example, outside the prize money business, which I think you alluded to, doesn't make money in itself? Well, I, I don't think I alluded to the, to the fact that it doesn't make money itself. Right. I still think that there is big growth potential, especially, like you mentioned earlier, with the international events happening, TI, also the Saudi World Cup. Right. That business will grow, and we are, ex we are excited because the monetization levels is increasing, the amount of sponsorships, that interest that we're also racking up is okay, increasing right. as well. Yeah. But, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, Fish but lot, yeah. <laughs> I do think that there will be more exciting uh, industries that pop up in the overall esports space. Because when right. you are publishing, for example, an esports title and creating esports league out of that, that's a whole esports ecosystem in its own that you can make a lot of different revenue streams from mm -hmm. instead of just focusing on one team business. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a bit of a gaming renaissance in China now. We talk about Tencent and you know Wukong and all that. Uh, this coming off years of maybe a lot of regulatory scrutiny about how much screen time and how much eyeballs should be playing these games as well. How would you classify the, envir the regulatory environment now in I, China? I would say right now it's uh, very welcoming and it's a very exciting time. You know, over the last few years, I think this would probably be the best time if we're looking into uh, investing into game development and uh, seeking high quality produced Chinese games looking to, you know, succeed on a world stage. I would say now that Wukong has shown Chinese culture can be expanded and taught to the West through the method of a very high quality game, I, w I think there will be more and more games like Wukong that come up, not just on PC and console, yeah. potentially on mobile as well, I which see. at times will fit even better for the esports industry as we look into tap into them. Yeah, uh, part of being a public company is now the, the public is focusing on your financials. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one analyst, I think, when look at, looking at the forecast on revenues this year, $100 million. Do so you think you'll get to $100 million in revenue this year or next year? And when do you think you'll be profitable? Well, getting to $100 million, I don't think, is an unrealistic goal for us. Okay. I, I'm very confident that our company will be able to make that. In terms of profitability, uh, we have actually crossed the uh, non-gap profitability mark previously, but I think 2025 will be a very big year for us in terms of profitability. Okay, so you turn a profit next year. Gap. Uh, hopefully in different <laughs> metrics, uh, but um, I, I don't predict the future. Right. But in terms of where I see the company go with right. the new business streams that we'll be including, uh, and those will obviously be rolled out by 2025, hmm. absolutely 2025 will be a big year for the NIP group. Hmm. Okay. Mario, we're going to leave it there, but thank you so much. Mario Ho, Chairman and Co-CEO of NIP Group, joining us here in our Hong Kong studios. Yep, uh, just ahead here, Hong Kong hitting back after the U.S. warns, well, businesses in the city have heightened legal risks. The details of that story just ahead. This is Bloomberg. Okay, welcome back here. So the big story, I think this, this came on Friday uh, over the weekend here. Hong Kong's government is pushing back against what they describe as false and baseless accusations from the U.S. That's after Washington published a business ad advisory that warned of heightened legal risks under the city security laws. Let's bring in Rebecca Chung Wilkins, our Asia government and economy correspondent, to talk us through, of course, what the, let's start with the U.S. side. What are, what's the U.S. worried about? So two major components of this warning. The first is very domestic. It's about the national security law in Hong Kong. And it's a warning. It's quite an extensive list here um, that uh, American authorities are worried about lobbying, market analysis that relies on government data, publishing media uh, analysis or commentary, engaging with reporters, think tanks or NGOs. So it is quite an extensive list that they're warning U.S. businessmen, U.S. firms not to engage in or to be very, very careful 
all about how they engage and you know essentially that they could be uh, find themselves accidentally entangled in breaching national security laws in Hong Kong the other component is really concerned with Hong Kong as a transshipment hub and that covers everything from this increasing sort of frustration or concern that Russia for instance is using Hong Kong as a transshipment hub to uh, to import various components that are on uh, US entity lists and that are restricted in sanctions as well as this concern also that Hong Kong is used uh, in the pharmaceutical trade we know that the US and China for example are clamping down on that fentanyl on the production of fentanyl and finally also uh, related to export controls that Hong Kong is being used as again this transshipment hub to hu sort of send things via export hubs so there's this two components here one very domestic and one really much more geopolitical and we heard the response from the Hong Kong government they're saying you know you're you're creating panic what are we hearing from more from the government and from the business community on this? Yes, quite a stern response from the Hong Kong government. I think not a surprise at this point, given how robust they've been. But they came out quite quickly to, to sort of say that yes, and, and to sort of condemn the US for creating panic. Now, if we just think about how we started this year, AmCham came out with a report saying that US companies, the top requirement, the top demand for US companies in Hong Kong was that they just wanted the US government and the Hong Kong government to just stop talking about national security. That was their number one request. We have not seen that through this year. And another AmCham report recently after they came back from D.C. essentially saying they don't expect anything to improve between Washington and D.C. Uh, DC sorry, D.C. and Hong Kong anytime soon because also of the broader China-U.S. relationship. And I think privately investors have expressed this sort of frustration to me. I think there is a sense sometimes that the U.S. and, and, and sometimes the media too have overplayed the environment in Hong Kong that there is this feeling that they just want to get on and do business and that for them, despite the political crackdown, the realities of operating in Hong Kong haven't necessarily dramatically changed, even as that landscape has, as we know, to the politically dramatically changed. And so I think there is this sort of tussle here for U.S. companies who, on the one hand, of course, understand things have changed, but on the other hand, there's a desire to just get on and, and do business. Mm. Rebecca, thank you. Rebecca Chin Wilkins, our Asia government and economy correspondent here. Uh, very briefly, back to Mark. So one group of stocks we're tracking closely today amidst the broader sell of his property and following the, the sales numbers coming out of one of the big ones, Van Cudd, down about 3.7, as you can see that's playing out uh, across the sector. And by the way, this is one group of stocks that's had very, very well, uh, relatively speaking of late, because of some of the policy pronouncements and reports around such. Uh, related to this is this drop in iron ore prices and the demand for steel coming down. And we now are back to having a 90 handle in iron, or we dipped below that earlier on, but as you can see, still fairly depressed levels. And a look at U.S. and European futures going into the Monday session, and things are looking slightly stable, albeit, of course, declines across the Asia-Pacific. We'll leave you with a look at the silver lining here.